This is The Roger Hedgecock Show. And welcome to the Romco Group Studio at UTTV on this Friday. Well, the president has denied that he spies on Americans. The New York Times breaks the story today that the National Security Agency certainly does. We'll have the details after we check our headlines with San Diego First News. more insight as to what was discovered in James DiMaggio's home when it burned to the ground August 4th. A new search warrant reveals there were remnants of handcuff boxes, used condoms, and a handwritten note. Now, details of the notes were not released. However, a letter from 16-year-old Hannah Anderson was found in the home. Other items seized from DiMaggio's home include duct tape, cut extension cords, and a propane torch. Arson devices were all, uh, also turned up, which investigators think were used to set the home on fire. Sheriff's authorities declined on any specifics listed in the warrants, saying it's all part of an ongoing investigation. Meantime, kidnapped victim Hannah Anderson made her first public appearance since being rescued in Idaho, surprising even her family and friends. Now, she showed up to a fundraiser being held for her family at the Bull Weevil in Lakeside yesterday. The 16-year-old was kidnapped by family friend DiMaggio. Now, DiMaggio also allegedly tortured and killed Anderson's mother and younger brother. Anderson did not speak to the media, but her father, uh, but her father basically thanked everyone for their support. Hannah sends her love. She's doing good day by day, and uh, we'll just keep moving forward from here. We have a lot of expenses in front of us. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not a rich man by any means, but, uh, you know, on a, on a lot of things, we'll probably end up donating some of the money if there's extra to exploited children. And um, right now we're just looking for her future and get her settled. 20% of the proceeds from the fundraiser will help pay for the funerals of Christina Anderson and eight-year-old Ethan. And we'll be back in another 13 minutes with more San Diego First News. All right, welcome back to the Roger Hedgecock Show here at the Aramco Group Studio. It is Friday. Yes, I'm still reeling from yesterday in the Peggy Shannon press conference with Gloria Allred where this uh, great-grandmother came out with specific allegations of sexual harassment and worse from uh, Bob Filner, and particularly worse being that he told her to keep quiet about it by that gesture of shush. Here's what she said. On July 12th, the day after I saw the first media coverage when the mayor walked by my desk and motioned for me to be quiet. I was blown away. He had said it in the news. Oh, well, apparently we had some trouble with the video, but we'll play it again because t today coming up, Gloria Allred in person, Jan Goldsmith in person, Carl Luna in person in a roundtable discussion about the latest on the Bob Filner saga. In the meantime, here's the latest on spying on America. One nation under surveillance. On the Jay Leno program a couple of days ago, the president flat out said there was no domestic spying program. Uh, you know, we don't have a domestic spying program. What we do have are some mechanisms where we can track uh, a phone number or an right. email address that we know is connected to uh, some sort of terrorist threat. And uh, you know, that information is useful. The New York Times breaking the story today uh, based on, uh, again, more revelations from uh, Edward Snowden that the National Security Agency has, quote, broken privacy rules and overstepped its legal authority, quote, thousands of times. That is to say, spying on ordinary Americans with unauthorized, as they put it, unauthorized surveillance, spying on the United States. Now, the president has made a big point that the, the uh, uh, Foreign uh, Intelligence Surveillance Court has oversight over all of this spying, that we don't do this except with a court approval. The court is secret. It meets in secret. It has a secret judge. It has secret proceedings. The judge cannot even bring in a pencil, make notes, or take anything out of the courtroom. He only hears one side, which is the government. 
Now a judge has actually come forward. One of the judges who actually works on this has come forward, Judge Reggie Walton, who said in a written statement to the Washington Post that his court does not have the capacity to, to investigate issues of noncompliance, that in fact his court does not have the authority to do oversight. They have no staff. They can't do it. In other words, there is no oversight. This is a sham, and the spying continues on Americans. This continues as well. We all have cell phones. I think almost everybody has at least one, and many people have more than one. There's a little known plan now for the Obama administration, the federal government, to go around Congress and actually impose a new tax on your phone bill. Now, one of the fundamental building blocks of our country is that taxes cannot be imposed on us except by our consent, that is, through our elected representatives. No taxation without representation. Remember that from the Revolutionary War. One of the fundamental reasons why we have a country is that our idea was the ordinary people, the people of the country, cannot be taxed unless their representatives vote for them to be taxed. Now, the Obama administration has said, we're going to have to tax your phones because we're going to need more money. We're going to need more money because we need to increase high-speed internet at our schools. Well, I think increasing high-speed internet at the schools, very good idea. Bad idea to take that good reason and apply it with an, a, a, a dictatorial edict that we must all pay more on the taxes for our, um, for our phones. Four to five billion dollars uh, is going to be needed to put this high-speed internet in the schools, so we're going to add about $12 in fees over three years to the phone bill. It'll be a small amount. They always start with a small amount. But the fundamental break with American tradition will be that the president, not the Congress, will order a tax on Americans. If he gets away with this, there's no holding back in terms of the powers the president will have. Now, much has been made about the rodeo clown that, way, that, that wore the Obama mask. And there's all kinds of, now the, the latest is that the NAACP in Missouri wants a federal investigation. It's a civil rights issue. It's, you know, this and that and the other. And we all know, and we got into this the other day, about uh, how the, the Bush mask, you know, was all over the place during the Bush years. And he was uh, guillotined and he was burned in effigy and all kinds of other things. And that was all political dissent and protected by the First Amendment and all that stuff because it was Bush. And by the way, I agree that it's protected and I agree that it's political dissent and I agree that it's okay. Just like it's okay for this rodeo clown, good grief. The same mask, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you the final thing on this. I hope it's the final thing on this issue. The same mask, this Obama mask, was worn by the president himself on a skit he did on Saturday Night Live. It looked like this. Hey, great Obama mask. Yeah, well, who is that under there? The president wore the mask. It was funny. It was funny when the clown wore it. It was funny when he wore the Bush mask. Uh, I mean, come on. All of that is protected speech. That's what America is about. That's what we do to keep our presidents humble. And don't they need a little bit of that hum humility? Now, the... Um, Yesterday we showed you a video, fascinating video. Reggie Love is President Obama's personal assistant. He calls him his, his body man. Uh, Reggie Love was with the president on that famous night when the SEAL Team 6 caught up with Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. And the whole, you remember the, the still shot, and here's the shots, you know, from, uh, and this is the uh, reconstruction of this, I believe. Uh, in the movie, but the, the idea was that in the Situation Room, now in the White House they've got this command center, the Situation Room, and in the Situation Room uh, there's a famous still shot of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of State Clinton and S the Department of Defense Secretary and the uh, Vice President sitting around a table. Over in the corner is Barack Obama sitting in a chair and some other staff is standing behind him. And that was used in the campaign, remember the famous slogan, uh, Osama bin Laden is dead and General Motors is alive, remember? So they got Osama bin Laden, but was he there in the Situation Room the entire time? Do we have this video to show again? I want to show the Reggie Love video. Here's, here's Reggie Love, watch this. Most people were like down in the Situation Room, but he was like, I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to be down here, I can't watch this entire thing. I'm just... So he, myself, Pete Souza, the White House photographer, Marvin, we played, we must have played 15, hand, 15 games of spades. 
They were in the dining room playing cards. Okay. Now, I thought the best video of the week, a sort of a wrap-up day for us, was Ashton Kutcher at the uh, Teen uh, Award, Teen Choice Awards, and his advice to the screaming teens there to think about something more seriously. Yes, he's turned 35, and I think he's gotten more serious. Listen to this. My name is actually not even Ashton. Ashton is my middle name. My first name's Chris. And, and it always has been. And I, it got changed when I was like 19 and I became an actor. But there were some really amazing things that I learned when I was Chris. And I wanted to share those things with you guys because I think it, it's helped me be here today. I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job in a factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. The sexiest thing in the entire world is being really smart. And being thoughtful. And being generous. Everything else is crap, I promise you. And everything around us. Go watch that whole video, it's fantastic. All right, look, uh, we're gonna come up with uh, Gloria Allred, Jan Goldsmith, and Carl Luna later in the show on an update on the whole Filner thing that's been going on all this week, all the breaking news. In the meantime, breaking news, sex harassment training in the Marines. What does that look like? A first-hand report coming up after this. Stay with us. This is The Roger Hedgecock Show. And welcome to the Aramco Group studio here at UTTV. Well, uh, Gretel Kovach was up there when 300 Marines got the latest in the training session on sexual harassment. What was that like? We'll find out right after this when we check our headlines with San Diego First News. word this afternoon five planes will be sky riding a message to Mayor Bob Vilner at three locations around town it's being put on by a radio station the messages will read surrender Bob now this comes as a great grandmother and City Hall volunteer accuses Vilner of unwanted sexual advances Peggy Shannon fought back tears during a press conference downtown yesterday she was standing by her attorney Gloria Allred Shannon says she volunteered three times a week at City Hall and would see the mayor walk by her desk several times a day now, at first she was flattered the mayor would talk to her, but quickly became disturbed when his comments became inappropriate. On the day that Mayor Filner came by my desk and asked me if I thought he could go eight hours in one night, I was shocked that he would say that to me. Shannon said there were times she would go home and cry. She also began feeling depressed and fearful of losing her job if she declined Filner's advances. Allred says she filed a formal complaint, which is currently under review. Shannon wants Filner to step down and issue her a personal apology. Meantime, Filner's trip to Paris is back in the spotlight. New reports suggest taxpayers may have paid to book four people for the trip. That's according to records obtained by our UT watchdog team. One email shows a city staffer looked into increasing her city credit card limit to pay for airfare for Filner and his entourage. The documents also showed airfare for two members of Filner's security detail, paid for by taxpayers at a total cost of more than 16 and a half thousand dollars all right well we have made it to friday let's get over to weather now del mar looking quite beautiful regardless of the low clouds out there sun will be out later this afternoon and we're going to top out at 75 degrees again today and we'll be right back
Welcome back to the Roger Hedgecock Show uh, at the Aramco Group studio at UTTV. Well, the Washington Post headline today, Pentagon issues new regulations aimed at combating sexual assault in the military. This issue, of course, is huge and connected to the Filner issue, but we'll get back to that in the next segment. Uh, in this segment, uh, Gretel Kovach has been there at the Marine Corps, at the Pendleton, at the Marine Corps base, talking about this issue. In fact, she participated with 300 other junior enlisted Marines at Camp Pendleton, and I guess they did it at Miramar, training sessions uh, called Sex Signals. Gretel, welcome to the program. Hello. What's going on? Well, I wanted to get an inside look at uh, the training that the Marine Corps uh, has been delivering to the Marines. And so they invited me to this session that um, went on at Camp Pendleton. It's also happening at Miramar. Really fascinating. It's meant to be engaging, lively. You had two actors. Um, they're, they're doing improv, they're acting out skits, and then they're asking the audience of Marines to uh, participate, to offer their judgments, their uh, perceptions and misperceptions. And so it became a, a way to deliver the message um, without uh, having them fall asleep by watching another s slideshow. The one that got my attention was the one where they're doing a skit about uh, well, you know, how much alcohol can a girl have and still say yes? Can a woman have and still say yes? Or is it, you know, as the alcohol impaired, you know, and so forth? And the Marines, I think, got confused on that one. Yeah, and it was it was more than just the alcohol. They they acted out a situation where two Marines had been kind of dating, um, but hadn't gone very far, you know, sexually. Um, they meet in their barracks room. They start drinking. You know, initially the female Marine is. Um, you know, and encouraging him, they're kissing, whatever. But at a certain point, she says, stop. I don't want to have sex. And the male Marine doesn't um, comply. And so then they ask the audience, is this rape? Um, no, well, they, they did ask that question, but they also asked, who's to blame, uh -huh. more importantly? Yeah. And uh, the troubling response was that most of the Marines in the audience thought they were both to blame. And so there was a little education moment there where they said, uh, no, actually, Rape is rape, and you, the, the partner can say no at any point before or during sex, and if you don't comply, it's still rape. This is tough for males. Before or during, you can say, yeah, so you can even, say no. I mean, even this during. is very tough because a male gets started, it's hard to stop. And they talked about that. I mean, and come they on. Said, they said, uh, I'd rather you self-service than be... A rapist. The Marines are going <laughs> through some training that I think former Marines are not going to recognize in this conversation. All right, but the object is serious, isn't it? A Marines oh, have a, the incident of rape in the Marine Corps is is very high. It's very serious, and um, you know I think there's still a lot of education that needs to go on. Um, you know, on that point that you that you mentioned. You know, um, you know, it, it, can you continue to have sex with someone after they say no just because they were kissing you or because they asked you to have sex? And, and the answer is, is no, that's illegal. Like, you, you have to stop or it, or it is considered rape. So, um, you know, it's hard to understand why there, some of these basic facts still need to be driven home. But if you, I mean, look at the Mayor Filner scandal. I mean, this is a societal problem. It's yes. not unique to the military. The rules are changing here. Well, yes, and well, actually, they are in regards to the UCMJ. Yeah. Um, they expanded the definition of sexual assault so that if you grope someone through their clothing, you know that is now considered sexual assault as well. So yes, the rules, in a sense, are changing. But one thing unique with the military and specifically the Marine Corps is the high turnover. You know, seventy percent of the Marines serve one term. So for the junior enlisted, a lot of them haven't gotten as much training on this issue in recent years as you might believe. Here's one of the coordinators there, uh, Marco, talking about this program at, uh, at Pendleton. And the training is a two-person show. It involves uh, some humor and some improvisation. So it draws the Marines in and uh, with the training it hits on points and topics that we normally do with PowerPoint or kind of canned media. And so this thing kind of livens it up and kind of is more, sometimes a little easier for the people in the stands to receive it and to kind of participate and feel that they're actively participating and learning with it. So that's the difference, I think. One of the Marines in that audience, Cody, had this reaction. I don't think it's working. Uh, it's working in some aspects because I see uh, more reports going. People realize they have uh, been used to help. I think that's good. But as far as the acts themselves going down, I mean, we have a really highly sexualized culture, and 
I don't know if that's a, a, pro a problem that kind of makes it happen. I, I don't know because, it, you know, there's no really a way of, I don't know, like the psychology behind it. So I think that might have a lot to do with it. I don't think he's convinced, Gretel. <laughs> yeah, but he raises a good point. I mean, basically he's saying, you know, a rapist can go through you know, 10,000 of these programs and they Still. probably aren't going to change their ways. But something else came up um, in the context of the presentation and that's, they told the Marines, you have a duty to intervene. If you see, oh, yeah. you know, they acted out this skit where, um, you know, they're in a bar, uh, one person approaches the other, the woman isn't receptive. They said, it, y it's your duty to, to step in there, just like, you know, you would help any other person in trouble. Story coming up tomorrow? This Sunday. weekend. This weekend. We'll look for it. Real thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Ty Hines is standing by with our uh, feedback at this Roger Hedgecock Show Facebook page. We're talking about uh, the, uh, are, you, uh, are you surprised that the National Security Agency is now admitting spying on Americans? Ty, what'd we get? What's up, Roger? We got a lot of feedback on Facebook like usual. Um, I have some questions for you, but I want to get right into some of your feedback first. Connor Murphy says, no. The NSA has been forthright. We just need to trust our administration. What do you think about that? Well, good luck, because the president, just a few days ago on Jay Leno, we played it again, said there was no domestic spying program. We're not spying on Americans. Now they admit today they are. Well, here's another feedback question uh, pertaining to trusting the administration. Monica Zarishian says, considering the government just officially confirmed the existence <laughs> of Area 51 today, perhaps they're turning a page in their top secret rule book. That could be. They did do that. And, and by the way, Bill, I think if it wasn't for Edward Snowden, we wouldn't know anything about this well, NSA spot. What is next for uh, Snowden at this point? I mean, are they going to have are they going to be more lenient on him now that they're being transparent, I guess, is what I don't think he's going to trust the government. He's staying in Russia. Yeah, I, I would, too, if I was him, Roger, at this point. Ty Hines, thanks very much. appreciate it. All right, Great we're going to come back. And when we come back, Jan Goldsmith, the city attorney of San Diego. Gloria Allred, the attorney who's brought forward two of the women who have complained out of the 15 now about uh, Mr. Filner's sexual harassment. We'll be back. Stay with us. This is the Roger Hedgecock Show. And joining me in a few moments, Carl Luna and Gloria Allred and Jan Goldsmith and the latest on the Filner saga. Let's check our headlines first with San Diego First News. Well, this next story could take the prize for the dumb criminal of the week. A man who was arrested on Wednesday on drug charges in Chula Vista is now accused of vandalizing the front door of the police station just minutes after he was released. Police say Jason Rodriguez was released Wednesday, but as soon as he left, surveillance video shows him tagging the glass doors. The 33-year-old was rearrested and is being held on $10,000 bail. Damage to the window is estimated at more than two thousand dollars. Hmm. Crews are still cleaning up in Mission Valley after a car crashed into a fire hydrant, sending water gushing into the street. It happened on Camino del Rio South near Texas Street around five this morning. Repairs should be completed later this afternoon, but until then, several businesses in the area will be without water service. Keep in mind, if you are headed that direction, that road will be closed all day. Yikes. Right, South Bay motorists beware a 14 hour freeway closure dubbed Darmageddon begins this Sunday. This is a, a map of the closures that will be taking place. The 805 freeway will be blocked off between State Route 54 and 905 starting at 3 p.m. Sunday until 5 a.m. the next morning. Caltrans says crews will be demolishing the East Palomar Street Bridge to make way for a new direct access ramp to express lanes that are currently under construction along that route. All right, we have made it to Friday. Let's get over to weather now. Here is Mission Bay looking beautiful, if you ask me. Now, most of you did wake up to cloudy skies, patchy fog along the coast, but just like yesterday, that sun's going to keep us company to make for a mostly sunny day. Gosh, just can't get over how gorgeous it is out there. Take a look at your weekend weather. Our average high today across the county, 75 degrees. Tomorrow, 77. Then we'll be back in the mid-70s come Sunday, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to the Aramco Group studio at UTTV. Seems like every day there's something new on the saga of uh, Mayor Bob Filner. And uh, yesterday it was probably for me the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of I, I, I can't take anymore. Enough is enough. Glory Allred, you've now produced and, and talked with uh, uh, Peggy Shannon, the most delightful woman, and just her whole presentation. I was in tears at the end of this thing. I'm telling you, it was emotional. It was terrible to hear. She has to be the most courageous woman in this town coming forward like that. Well, I, I do give a lot of credit to Peggy and also to the other women who have come forward, yeah. of course, also to Irene McCormick Jackson, my client who is suing Mayor Filner in the only sexual harassment lawsuit against him right now, and also to Michelle Tyler, who is the yeah. uh, person who was is caring for the American Marine injured in Iraq, who unfortunately Michelle was, uh, she alleges, sexually harassed by the mayor in the mayor's office in City Hall. And all the other women, and it just, you know, it's hard to break silence, but it's long overdue for this to happen because the mayor needs to be accountable. And the only way he's going to be accountable is if people speak the truth to power and speak the truth to the mayor and let everybody know what's going on in San Diego. Now they've done that, and you brought them forward, and, you know, you're pretty knowledgeable of Democratic Party politics. You pointed out yesterday, uh, rightfully so, Barbara Boxer says go, uh, Feinstein says go, Pelosi says go. All these Democrats say go. Uh, why isn't he going? Well, I guess only the mayor and or his attorneys can answer that. But uh, individuals in power don't give up power easily. Uh, they uh, fought for it. And uh, maybe he's got economic reasons. Maybe he's got uh, personal reasons. Uh, I don't know what his reasons are. But uh, the handwriting has been on the wall for quite a while. The people of San Diego has had it up to he here yep, up and, to here. Beyond. and beyond. And beyond, absolutely. He has to resign. It's the only way what if to he doesn't? justice. We're, we're, we're stuck with this. He doesn't have to. We'll get uh, to it in a moment. Jan Goldsmith has another theory. We'll get to it in a moment. But, but right now, he doesn't have to. Well, uh, legally, on this day, he doesn't have to. But, uh, you know, he didn't have to run for mayor either. And he needs to do the right thing and put the people first. And if he does the right thing and puts the people of San Diego first, he'll resign. And hopefully, at least his advisors can tell him that would be the best way no for him of, and the people of San Diego. No sign of that yet. Well, you know, he's hired not just one, but two law firms to fight. All kinds. The good fight. Uh, we're ready for that battle. Uh, and we're going to fight him every inch of the way. All right, Carl Luna, uh, it strikes me that the only voice we haven't heard from is organized labor. Labor has been unbelievably silent about this. How much longer can they be silent? At some point, one would imagine the Labor Council has to weigh in, particularly since so much of their membership happen to be women. And this is extremely damaging to the image of the party and to anybody who's associated with Bob Filner. If he goes down in all of this, he'll take those who are supporting him with him. Well, wow. implications for politics locally being what? It could hurt the reputation of labor leaders. It could hurt their ability to field new candidates into elected office. It'll be used by opponents to candidates, labor supports, until the cows come home. Wow. All right, Jan Goldsmith, now yesterday you put out, uh, among the other things that happened here, I got a memo from you saying that there was a Section 108 of the Charter which allows the City Council to seek from a court a declaratory relief, an order that Mayor Filner be, be stripped of his office. Tell me about that and what's, and what's the factual uh, basis for that? Well, let, let me just say, say that we have a City Charter that makes it very difficult to um, remove a mayor. In fact, it's easier to remove the President of the United States than to remove the Mayor of San Diego. We have no impeachment provisions. All there is is really a recall. And people have asked me to look through the Charter and how can people this... People from the City Council? People from the media, from the community, and the City Council. Um, isn't there another way? Is there another way? Yeah. A legal way, since we, we can't have a coup d'etat. Although Gloria would like that. <laughs> and there's, I know I a few women that. who would really like that. Uh, we believe in the rule of law. There are some provisions in our city charter having to do with removal of an officer of the city. And since we now have a strong mayor, the strong mayor is the chief executive officer under our charter and is subject to those forfeiture provisions. One of them is section 108, which says that every officer who willfully um, allows unauthorized payment of city money uh, is subject to removal from office. Now let me ask you about that. What, what do you think the factual basis is? I guess people have been guessing about this, but what do you think it is? Well, since it's only been used once unsuccessfully years ago because it wasn't an officer, uh, we have to borrow from other provisions of law and unauthorized payment means exactly what it means. It's not authorized by the law or by the policies. And I'll give you some examples that could be a basis. For example, hiring your own lawyer, giving you legal advice, 
at city taxpayer expense through, as an employee. You can't do that. That violates our that's policies. That's the chief of staff, Lee Burdick, you're yes, talking about? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, who gives, who assists the private lawyers. Um, another would be Sun Road possibility. $100,000 comes in unauthorized and $100,000 goes out of the city treasury unauthorized. Never sees the light of day of the city council. Another might be a trip to Paris, for example. Never heard anything about that. But charging th over $30,000 to city expense, I have yet to see one thing that shows that this is any city business, any city interest was involved. In fact, I saw the draft of the speech in Paris which was drafted by the Iranian group that he was visiting. They drafted the speech for their purposes. And then finally, what came to light um, recently during our investigation, and we did disclose to the public because it's a PRA request, is the fact that he had a city credit card and racked up a lot of charges and never gave re uh, any backup material. And which is required. You have to which receive. is required. Yeah. And ultimately, f the Comptroller found out about $1,000 worth of personal charges that has never been reimbursed and the city has paid. Now, one or, all, one, or, I know, but one <laughs> or all of those, or any others, will now be, uh, I take it that the city council, it's in their court to take your opinion, uh, legal opinion, and these factual circumstances and decide whether they're going to take action under 108? Yes. And the, when are they going to do that? Um, August 28th is currently, um, is currently set. We'll present the evidence. And they'll, like any client, they'll weigh the pros and cons, and we'll give pros and cons. If they decide to go forward, then we would file what's called a complaint and declaratory relief, which is entitled to priority. We would actually go down to the presiding judge and we'd, and we'd ask for um, a re relatively swift hearing. Now, this is due process, so it has to be respected, but it, a relatively swift hearing because Meaning of the turmoil. 10 days? Well, it's going to be up to the presiding judge, and okay. I wouldn't want to estimate that, but we would, we would plead and say, look, our city is in turmoil, and this is really one of the few bases upon which the mayor can re be removed. And, and we you think, think there's a judge? with the backbone to take the factual circumstance and declare Mayor Filner is out of office? Yes. Lori Allred, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I think he knows the judges in San Diego better than I do. Uh, but I, I will say this. There is, of course, other things going on as well. For example, there is the criminal investigation uh, by the San Diego Sheriff's uh, investigators and uh, with the Attorney General. Uh, in a sense overseeing that investigation and I guess the Attorney General will make a decision hopefully soon as to whether or not there is any basis for a criminal charge against Mayor Filner. If as and when there were to be such a charge if there were a felony or felony charges if in fact he were convicted I'm not convicting him before he has a trial right. I don't know right. if he's guilty of anything or not do you have any uh, sense then, of when then, then definitely he would no longer be mayor. That, of course, would take a long time. That would take a year. Or it more. would, but I, it's just I'm saying we can't ignore that that's in the mix. Uh, it may be that the FBI is also investigating. Uh, so we'll have to see. I, I think do you have the any mayor's more in a world of hurt. He's got a world of trouble. If, do you have any more uh, civil suits coming? Uh, I only have one civil suit filed at this time. Right. Do you have any more coming? I never know what the future is going to bring. Do you have any more press conferences in mind with more people, more women coming forward? Nothing planned at this time, but every day is a new day and, 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 you a, do get and calls. a new adventure. You do get calls. I definitely have had many more calls from women than the number of women who have come forward. Okay. In other words, I've had some calls where the women have not come forward, and uh, I'm not going to say who else I may or may not represent at this time. But the stories you're probably hearing are worse or... The well, same sort well, of thing. I mean, you know, there, there, are, lo there are a lot <coughs> of similarities. Yep. But uh, all I'm saying is not every woman wants to be right. go public. And I support that, and I respect that. And whatever their decision is, for whatever reasons they have, that needs to be supported. But they did want me to know what is going on. Okay. Carl, if I, if I, go ahead. If I can add something on, uh, just on the, on the forfeiture of office. Uh, there are legal mechanisms to remove him from office. And if the people of San Diego want him out of the office and the uh, city council, he will be removed. Uh, whether it be 108, recall, resignation, or the last resort is amend the city charter and right. remove him and give him the power of city council to remove him. And the message says there'll be a march on Sunday at 2 p.m. There'll be a march on Sunday yes. at 2 o'clock to City Hall. Outside of City Hall. Everyone, you all should come. We all, we all should be there. Gosh, I, I want to be there. This is crazy. Well, please do. Carl Luna, thanks for coming in. I'm sorry we're running out of time. Lori Allred, thank you. Jan Goldsmith, Godspeed. I'm Roger Hedgecock. We'll be back. Billy Moore next. Archie Moore's son with anybody, any boy can.
This is The Roger Hedgecock Show. All right, enough of the bad news. Let's start with something that's really working well in the community. Anybody Can Foundation, founded in 1957 by Archie Moore, his son Billy Moore, and one of the kids has been benefited from the boxing and the tutoring. We'll get to that right after we check our headlines with San Diego First News. In just a few moments, the Little League World Series will get underway, featuring our East Lake Little League All-Stars. UTTV's Tristan Nichols joins us now with more. Diego, listen, do I need to say anything more than just to show you my T-shirt? There you go. That's what it's all about today. Excitement is growing as the East Lake Little League team has its first game in the World Series. I don't pretend to know a lot about baseball because I'm not from around these parts, but hey, I can sense the excitement in the air. Now, one person who knows that very well is Bryant uh, Villison, general manager of the East Lake Tavern and Bowl down here in Chula Vista. Excitement is growing, right? It is, it is. How many people are you expected down here today? This is going to be the main focal event, the community event down here. Well, this is the first game, so we're hoping to pack this place. Um, and what have you got going on? You've got, I believe you're going to be selling merchandise to support parents to, to actually go to the World Series events? Yeah, we've been doing it all week long. Today will be uh, the new merchandise where I'll say the West on there instead of the East Lake on there, so it should be good. Okay, hundreds of people um, coming down. It's, it's been quite a big media kind of party for you as well. Yeah, I'm not used to that stuff, but it's been like a circus the past two weeks. You've had ESPN calling you and everything? And ESPN, I had uh, every single news broadcast, radio station, so yeah. Brilliant. Now, just to get it clear, uh, San Diego, here pr pretty much is the place to be to come to, to see the event. You've got it on here at 12 noon. 12 noon, the game is live on ESPN. On all these screens here, hundreds of people coming down. It's going to be a big community event. Um, go East Lake, I think it's fair to say. Back to the studio for now. All right. Our Tristan Nichols for us. Thank you so much for that report and good luck to our East Lake Little League All-Stars. We'll be back in another 13 minutes with more San Diego First News. Billy Moore joins us now, and he's the uh, son of Archie Moore, the uh, boxer. And I remember, God, I'm so old now, but Billy, I remember Archie Moore so well. We, we, we used to go down to that house that had the, uh, the, the swimming pool with the, uh, in the shape of a boxing glove. Boxing glove. Is that still there? It's still there. Still there, I love it. Still there. <laughs> and you know what's still there, too, is a wonderful foundation that your father started, and you've been running for, oh, I don't know, 20 years now? A little over 20 years. ABC and, uh, Youth Foundation. ABC Youth Foundation, anybody can. Anybody can. And anybody can in this country that chooses to. And uh, what we do, we teach our youngsters how to step off in life with their best foot forward, without cowardice, but with courage and dignity. And as we all know, this gang violence and drug epidemic that's in this country, uh, it's taking over our kids, especially the gang violence. And little, about 50 years ago, well not, about 50 years ago, this little kid, my dad said the United States, as a matter of fact, he met with President Eisenhower. He said the United States is headed for a gang and a drug epidemic. He said if we would go into prevention, opposed to rehabilitation. We could save billions of dollars. So that's what we're doing uh, uh, with our youngsters, such as this youngster here, Jaime. Uh, we teach our youngsters to step off in life with their best foot forward, without cowardice, but with courage and dignity. Nancy Reagan said, just say no. But nowadays, there's a science to say no. That's absolutely right. All right, so, and you're doing two things, actually. You're doing this mentoring, which I love, the one-on-one -on -one with the with this reading and writing skills and all of that, and you're doing the boxing. Now together, what are those things that change? There's a third implement. Uh, there's, there's a, a third one. There's a third implement. We teach conflict resolution. No. We have the National Conflict Resolution Center come in and, and, and work with our kids also. Uh, Amy Morad uh, and her husband, Dr. Morad, we, our boxing gym has a full-fledged learning center that's set up, full-fledged library that's set up in the boxing gym. And we have tutors that uh, we have a contract with Golden Hill Elementary School and all of the King Chavez schools. We go into four schools a week teaching ABC. That's and so great. The, the, and we have uh, uh, teachers that we pay to tutor our, tutor our youth. And it's, uh, it's... On it's, the boxing side, we got any champs coming out of there? We have quite a few. <laughs> quite I bet you few. do. <laughs> but I was just, uh, uh, something came to mind. I remember years ago, my dad was very fond of you. I don't know if you remember the night 
that they were honoring him. Yes, I do. And he, uh, I think he had talked with you, and he insisted that you come down. That's great. Yeah, he was a fine man, just yeah. a great man. And, and his legacy, because you've carried it on with these kids, has just been great. And I wanted to congratulate you, but let's introduce Jaime Luis. Okay. Jaime, how are you? I'm doing good. Now, when did you first come to this program? I came to the program a few years back. Um, this is going to be my third year here. So. What, what grade were you in then? I was barely starting off my first year in high school, yeah. freshman year. Now, so. has, tell me about mm. which part of this thing has really helped you. Now, the boxing part, you've gotten the Both mentoring parts, part. Both parts, actually. Yeah. Um, I started off boxing mostly. Uh, for a few years, I did that. Um, but then I decided, like, mostly with the learning center and stuff, I liked helping out with the kids and all that. So I did some of the programs that they had. So after school, I would come, box, and then also, you know, sometimes I would do homework. And like the kids would ask me for help, and I just started helping them out. So now I don't really box anymore. I just like kind of help with kids. Work with the kids yeah. who are coming in. Yeah. So yeah, you I'm become almost like a teacher. You think yeah. you, you think you're going to pursue that in life? Uh, I don't know. Right now I'm planning on like going to um, a school for graphic design and like uh, special effects. So that's what I want to do. Has the mentoring and the one-on-one -on -one stuff that you get there with these folks at this center has that helped you? I mean, how has that specifically helped you in high school? It, it really has because um, this year, like this past year in high school, I had stopped coming to the ABC and like my grades mm -hmm. were dropping and you know I was just going through some stuff like you know grade stuff going down. But um, when I came back, you know they started talking to me and like my grades um, they improved and now I'm doing a lot better. Like everything that Instructor Moore has taught me and lots of the other teachers there, they re it has really affected me and lots of the other kids that I know. Well, congratulations, that's yeah. really a great story. Yeah. So, Billy, if we could save, you know, one from going downhill, maybe more than one, you, it's, a, it's a giant problem, uh, as you point out. I mean, a lot of these kids are impacted negatively by everything that's going on around them. Everything. And, and I think that uh, this, uh, and I'm not saying I'm beyond anything, but, you know, a lot of things in this country, we've lost our moral fiber. And, and it's affecting a lot of our youth. And all, of our, all our youth are looking for now is just somebody with the nerve, not just me. There are people all out in this city, this community. If they would just take the time to stop and say something to a kid, it could really make a difference. Because they're looking for guidance. They don't know what to do. Every time you look at the news, there's something going on that's, that affects us negatively. And, uh, uh, Absolutely. And, and ABC, ABC. Yep. Anybody can. Anybody can. Now, Any, I know on behalf of my audience, I just want to say, because I know what they're thinking right now. They're thinking, how do I help this guy get more of these Jaime <laughs> uh, in, you know, with the kind of help that we, they should get? How do they well, help? Well, what they can do is go to our webpage. Go to our webpage, abcyouthfoundation.org. abcyouthfoundation.org. Yeah. And the number at the gym is 234-2200. And... What it takes, it, if, you, if you don't have dollars, we ask for your time. We need dollars, but we do ask for your time. Take your time to come in and see what it is that you can do. Now, you're working closely with the schools, and you mentioned yeah. some of the schools. What high school do you go to, Jim? Uh, I go to Lincoln High School. Lincoln, okay. Yes. So, now, Lincoln High School was rebuilt, mm -hmm. and it's a magnificent campus, yes. but I'm not sure they changed the inside of that school. That I don't know. Mm. He would have you know, the play. teachers and the and mm. the curric In other words, the kids coming out yes. of that school still are struggling. Yes, I to am. get into college yeah. and to get these kinds of things going for them. Yeah, that is true. I am, lots of the people that I know that recently graduated, they have issues with like applying for college, and they didn't really know how. So lots of them were, you know, freaking out last few yeah. weeks, like thinking, well, what do I do now? Where do I go? How you do I apply counselors for this? on campus yeah, that they, help you? They with? do, but I guess like they don't really go to them, or they don't ask I don't I guess it's just the kids that don't feel like asking well well Lincoln is a school that we're targeting to go into good uh, I'm not saying that uh, 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 the, the things that we do work mm -hmm. as I said we go to King Chavez Golden Hill School right I mean Golden uh, King Chavez Elementary School we go into the middle school and we go into the high school and we, we're getting ready to go into a, the second high school of theirs That's and great. we go into Golden Hill Elementary School and uh, I just met with the staff the other day, and they're looking forward to ABC coming back I'm looking to looking forward to having you back on the show. Thanks very much for coming in, Billy. Good Thanks to see you. Jaime, good luck on everything, all right? Thank you for having us. I'm Roger Hedgecock. Just thought we'd end with some good news. Have a great weekend. Back on Monday.